Dar Jamal spent a decade as a journalist in Iraq, attempting to capture the experience of the U.S.-led invasion and occupation from the perspective of ordinary Iraqis caught in the maelstrom of war. Upon returning to the U.S., Jamal, who was once a ski instructor and mountaineering guide, set out to visit some of the icy mountain terrains that he had explored over the years in order to report on the effects of climate change in these places that he loves. Hiking on Denali and in Glacier National Park, visiting the Great Barrier Reef, traveling to a remote Alut village on the Bering Sea, and journeying into the Amazon rainforest, Jamail engaged with people who have fished, farmed, and lived in all of these places that he visited, all the while consulting with climate scientists studying these areas. In his book, The End of Ice, Bearing Witness and Finding Meaning in the Path of Climate Disruption, Jamail offers an elegiac account of how climate change is affecting these places. Jamail wrestles with the inevitability and the finality of the losses we are experiencing due to climate chaos. He documents melting glaciers which supply potable water to billions, receding sea ice and diminishing seal populations upon which the Aleuts rely for both sustenance and cultural organization. And dying coral that has not seen a bleaching event like the one currently underway in at least 20 million years. As Jamal tries to come to terms with what he is seeing and experiencing, he likens his emotional responses to these, uh, to, to uh, what he experienced in his, during his years reporting from Iraq. There, he says, I felt a mixture of sadness, guilt, anger, powerlessness, anxiety, grief, and despair. He had hoped to make a difference, he says, with his war reporting, perhaps contributing to the end of the U.S. occupation in Iraq, and he hoped that he might make a difference with his climate reporting by, in his own words, bludgeoning people with scientific reports about increasingly dire predictions of the future. Perhaps that would wake us up, he thought. Along the way, however, he realized that what he truly needed to do was to, in his words, share his grief. Share his grief with others about what is happening to nature. To share his grief about what the climate crisis is doing to our planet and to ourselves. Like Jamal, many People today experience sadness, guilt, anger, powerlessness, anxiety, despair, and grief about the effects of climate change. In just the past few years, the number of news reports, magazine columns, journal articles about climate-related emotions has exploded. Have you noticed? Many of us gathered here today have experienced or are experiencing the grief of which Jamal writes. Perhaps it's a sadness about a favorite tree from your childhood that has been cut down, or a pang of melancholy as you pass a field of wildflowers being plowed under and paved over for yet another strip mall or housing complex. Perhaps it's a heartache from a distance. You've learned about the plight of polar bears or rhinoceros, or maybe it hits closer to home. It's the worry over your child's asthma worsened by the poor air quality in your community. Anxiety about the gas well and fracking operation that's just gone in nearby, wondering whether and how it might affect your water supply. The fear that accompanies an ever-lengthening fire season because your family's home was incinerated in the last fire season. Yes, many of us 
no climate-related anxiety and grief, even if we haven't always necessarily identified those feelings as having anything to do with climate change. We often fail to make that connection, in part because of the ways that our fossil-fueled, neoliberal, capitalist, economic, and social systems discourage us from making that connection. These principalities and powers who profit handsomely from the poisoning of the planet encourage us to ignore any emotional connection we humans may feel with the more than human world. Politicians, and corporate leaders, economists, and yes, many theologians tell us that the world of nature is somehow separate from, apart from the world of economy and culture. In other words, that it is separate from the realm of the human. They also tell us that that more than human realm has only instrumental value. It exists to be used for human economic purposes and used up if necessary. We find it difficult in these circumstances to find a repository for our grief because we are told that the objects of our affection in the more than human world are not worthy of our grieving. Emotional attachments to the world threaten to destabilize the way things are. They threaten the profits of those principalities and powers. The theorist Judith Butler, who's informed so many of us in our scholarship and our teaching, has noted that some lives are considered grievable, she says, while others are not. And that this differential or this, this differing allocation of grievability tells us what kind of subjects may be grieved and which ones may not. This, in turn, tells us what kinds of lives are livable, what kinds of lives are valued, and which lives are not. We know this. We know that there are many lives and many bodies that have been derealized or rendered ungrievable thus excising them from the realm of ethical and political consideration. Black and brown bodies, Asian bodies, female bodies, non-binary bodies, LGBTQIA lives, especially those whom Dr. Sprinkle has written about as unfinished, indigenous lives, economically and politically marginalized lives, to name only a few. These lives have been rendered so ungrievable, it has been necessary for a whole generation to rise up and to declare black lives matter. Think of that. Persons having to assert that their lives actually do matter. And now we add to the list of bodies and lives that have been rendered ungrievable, fossil-driven, climate chaos, or, or, and to this list of bodies and lives that has been rendered ungrievable, fossil-driven climate chaos adds the bodies and lives of the more than human world. The red wolf, the right whale, the lark bunting, the black land, tall grass prairie. Where do we find a place to mourn our losses? Where do we find companions to affirm them? as worthy of our grief. Well, perhaps we can begin by looking to the more than human world itself. In contrast to the climate changing principalities and powers who tell us that we humans are entirely separate from a dead and inert nature, our sacred scripture text for this morning suggests something different. In Job, we hear the protagonist reflecting on the limits of mortal life. Humans, says Job, have a short life full of turmoil. They blossom like a flower and wither. 
Ultimately, humans expire, according to Job, remaining lifeless until the very heavens expire. But he then contrasts the human condition with that of a tree. There is hope for a tree that if it is cut down, it may yet sprout again. It may yet bud and send forth its branches. The tree is alive despite the best human efforts, or the worst, if you will, to kill it. One scholar notes that these verses in Job turn on the distinction between hope and grief on the one hand and between trees and humans on the other. Further, the passage muddies the question of subjectivity in matters of hope and grief. Various translations suggest different things. The translation that John read for us from the NRSV suggests that the tree is an object of someone else's hoping. The New International Version does the same thing with that verse. The Old King James Version leaves the question of the subjective versus the objective generative unsettled, for there is hope of a tree, it reads. But others make the tree itself the hoping subject. The Australian Hebrew Bible scholar Norman Hobble translates verse 7 in this way, Now a tree has hope. It felled it will renew itself. In light of recent plant science and forest ecologies that has discovered how trees communicate with one another across their uh, fungal networks, even acting altruistically toward one another in community, the work of animal ethologists disabuses us of many, as is disabusing us of many of our notions of what separates us from other animals, think about the use of tools or the existence of language among other species. In light of these newly emerging findings, Job 14 suggests that we are not alone in our grief. That just as we humans experience grief and worry over the state of the planet, so we are joined by the trees who grieve for us as well. We are companioned in our grief and in our hope. In our Romans passage, read by Lillian, uh, among other things, Paul is wrestling with the creation stories of Genesis 1 through 3. The solidarity between humans and the rest of the world is very clearly expressed in Romans 8. It shares in both the suffering and the hope that mark human sin and brokenness and God's renewing and liberating work. But so focused have Christian interpreters been for so long on the relationship between the human and God that Paul's clear assumption here that the more than human world, that nature itself, that the creation is an intrinsic element of that relationship between the human and God. What's more, the more than human world of creation has its own voice to raise in mourning, in protest, and in longing for justice. We are now in Easter tide, only days removed from the central celebration of the Christian year. The joyful and hope filled celebration of the resurrection of the Christ. Easter may not seem like a good time to talk about grief and anxiety, but throughout the history of Christianity, its patriarchal triumphalism has accompanied and supported land theft, genocide, and the extractive capitalism that is at the root of global climate crisis. We have been too quick to gloss over these realities without an accounting. Many today wish to deny them completely for fear of making someone feel uncomfortable about them or even passing laws about what we can say about them to children in schools. But in the rush to celebratory hope, we render so many lives ungrievable, erasing them from the realm of moral considerability. Genuine hope, genuine hope, 
is rooted in an honest accounting, an honest appraisal of our reality. Without a sober acknowledgement of the way things actually are and have come about, the wounds will continue to fester. The anxiety will continue to gnaw. The wounding will go on and on and on. Grieving invites us to face the realities that confront us. As Douglas Christie suggests, grief requires a willingness to face our own frailty and brokenness as well as facing the fragility and brokenness of the world. Grief can facilitate a more intricate and expansive knowledge of the whole creation and a greater awareness of our relationship to that whole. Christie also suggests that grief can invite us into a greater awareness of our existence as woven into an intricate fabric of being, heightening our awareness even of the intricacy and beauty and spiritual value of all things. Grieving, mourning, lamenting, it can create empathy for that which is being damaged and lost, and it invites us to recognize our moral, ethical, and political responsibilities toward vulnerable ecosystems, persons, and communities. <clears throat> According to the public health researcher Ashley Willocks, ultimately, that which we are able to grieve indicates that which we value, that which we believe matters, that which we believe we should protect. Our scriptures suggest that the trees grieve for us Creation groans in labor pains along with us as we mourn our losses and as we hope for renewal. We and the rest of the creation are not separate. Our bodies are composed of the dust of ancient stars. Salty sea waters course in our veins. We share the animating breath of our Creator with all of the plants and animals around us. And we are dependent on one another in ways that are both material and spiritual across the human community and within the whole community of life. In 1991, Julie Pierce, a bright student and a bright light among students by all accounts, was returning from her weekend ministry in Ardmore, Oklahoma, when she was killed in an automobile accident. The school planted a tree in her memory. It stands today in the southwest corner of the Moore Building, just around the corner there outside of the windows of Raina's office. There's a plaque at its base commemorating Julie's life. One day many years ago, our late colleague Joey Jeter, who was the professor of homiletics when I first came to Bright, noticed some TCU work people marking the ground around the tree and making some plans. And so Joey went over to inquire with them about what they were doing. They replied that they were digging to install some sort of a, a line, a pipe, or electric, I don't recall what, but the Julie tree had to be removed. Joey urged them not to cut it down. He explained what it meant to the school, the life it commemorated, but the TCU workmen were undeterred. That tree was coming down, and that line was going right through where it stood. So Joey, being the tree lover that he was, and who regarded that tree as a sacred reminder of a sacred life, went and fetched a metal folding chair and planted himself right in front of that tree, right in the workman's path, and he refused to move until they relented. I don't know how long Joey sat there, but the workers finally routed their project around the Julie tree. 
Dr. Jeter and the Julie Tree worked together. Julie Tree, bearing witness to a human life, cut tragically short, and human gifts for the world snuffed out before they were able to blossom into their fullness. Jeter defending the right of the tree to be, to bear its witness to the world about a bright light. And today the Julie tree continues to bear her witness, grieving the loss of her namesake. And now too, the loss of our brother Joey, whose emotional connections to the more than human world were enormous and real and remind us of our own material connections with it. And Julie Tree, as one born of grief, invites us to grieve along with her for the things we are losing. In her grief, though, Julie Tree also speaks a hopeful word to all those who have ears to hear. A word about the beauty that these two human lives contributed to our world while they were among us. The beauty of the life who animates all things. The tree can teach us about the life we share with all things, that we share with all things. There is grief of a tree and the tree has hope. Amen.